fact, I also had a really weird dream that night. Something about that day always seemed off. I never figured out why. And why am I thinking about this now? Biggest drama. And your first experience with death. Welcome back. Today we're going to be playing a demo called The Wreck. My understanding is the full game should be coming out in the spring, so now's a great time to play it. The description of the game is something along the lines of following along a screenwriter where we go in the past and the present, like rewinding, fast forwarding to put together pieces of a puzzle, which sounds all very exciting. So let's get going. It's very Catholic. I love the art already. I don't know if that cat agrees with me, but it's cute. And the music is bopping. French? Oh. <laughs> Maybe I got a little ahead of myself when I introduced everything when I did. Like, maybe now would have been the time. It is a French development company, though. So, I mean, like, there's the option for French audio. It all makes sense for everything to be in French. <laughs> the way the music just starts up again. Oh. Maybe the music shouldn't be that great. It <laughs> shouldn't be that bopping when we are going to a hospital. I have a confession. I love crappy romantic comedies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a cliche. I can't help it. I love them. All those movies have that scene, you know? The girl is at her wit's end. She's been crying her eyes out. Her makeup is running. She looks like a zombie. She's done. Which is when Ryan Gosling <laughs> knocks on her door to coax her out. It has to be Ryan Gosling. Mm. <laughs> so like this moment when we're like disassociating and hoping that someone saves us when something terrible is going to happen at a hospital. Ah, shit. That sounds nothing like Ryan Gosling. <laughs> See? <laughs> This is the problem with my life, in a nutshell. It's not romantic, and it's certainly not a comedy. You say right. that, but I'm laughing. Where am I? What happened? <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. I shouldn't be laughing. Like the, like comedic timing of all of this. <laughs> I feel like it's intended to be funny, just like the way it's all said. Kind of like the dark humor. That, that like we kind of develop as a defense mechanism. It's just like. It feels like the game sets the scene for that when the music stops. You have to like purposefully click through and then the music just continues on. <laughs> and then it starts with like, I love dark comedy or like, I've not dark comedies. I mean, that's definitely a thing, but like, I love romantic comedies, but like the whole reason why we love romantic comedies, not not like we, not like you and I, but like the character is just like, because our whole life is fucking falling apart. And then we have this very stereotypical actor who always comes in and saves the day. And then we always live happily ever after. Like, isn't that what we're kind of sold on with romantic comedies? I also love the touch. How it's always Ryan Gosling. Always. All right. So I'm assuming that this is like, we're clicking on shit. Where am I or what happened? So like, what are we going to focus on? The game has kind of shown us where we are, assuming that still where we are, that feels like a, a silly sentence to say. What happened feels more like what I'm focusing on. Like, why are we in the, not we are in the hospital. Like, why do we have to go to a hospital? Like, who's in the hospital? What happened? I felt woozy and then oof, really, really hot. And I guess that I fainted. Oh. 
Well, we're sideways. So we guess we could be in the hospital. Or we could have heard really shitty news while we were in the hospital. So this idea that, like, maybe we're an unreliable narrator, but not intentionally. M- so these are the th- these are our thoughts. These are what we're saying. Piecing this shit together. Uh, well, drop to the hospital restroom floor like a sack of potatoes. I can guarantee you're not no the first one. place for a nap. Are you okay, Miss? Oh <laughs> shit, the doctor. <sighs> Also, like, no better person to, like, be there if that were to happen. I am sure that, like, you're not the first person who's fainted in front of a doctor for one reason or another. Putting that out there. But, like, this character is talking about it like it's this terrible, awful thing. Like, that shame, blame, and guilt of, like, I can't show weakness, and weakness would be fainting. Whereas the doctor, I imagine, is more like, are you physically okay? <laughs> Like, caring more about their physical well-being. So the more questions we ask, the more options we get. As in, like, the more questions we ask ourselves, the more internal uh, reflection, the more internal processing we do. Yeah, we'll go with that. That sounds good. It sounds great. Uh, Because now we have an actual word that we can ask versus word salad. It's not quite word salad. You get what I mean. You get what I mean. Honestly? Honestly? Not really, no. I'll be alright, though. Um, are you sure? We don't really have another option besides this lovely dark humor. How big are the bathroom stalls? Maybe this is a cultural thing. How big are the bathroom spa- stalls to where, like, you can full-on lay down and your feet aren't, like, sticking out of the bathroom stall? Because every time... I've been to a hospital. It sounds like I've been, sounds like I'm a concierge of hospital bathrooms. I'm not. I'm just an observer of things, if you will. Bathrooms are very often small, except for like that one at the very end, you know? Just just saying. Uh Aha, as if I could be sure of anything. (laughs) Still, I should probably update my guardian angel. Actually, now that I think about it, maybe there's something I know for sure. If I have to spend one more second lying on this filthy floor... There is one thing that I know for sure. It is that this character is sarcastic as fuck. I'm here for it. I'm just saying. I'm sure that this has served a purpose in this character's life as a defense mechanism, but, like, some high-quality sass here. Like, give this character a cookie for their humor. So we we, we can process the filth. I'm pretty sure that I'm going to vomit. Uh, vomit again, I guess. Oh. So now we can talk about the nausea, or we can just say that I'm good. I wouldn't put it past this character to just say that they're good. Because if we say that we're good, there's another way that we're denying what's going on. Kind of like humor feels like a level of denial. Like self-deprecating humor is a lot of that. It's like, let me poke fun at this because then it's not serious. (laughs) But... So much of the time, like culturally, we often say that we're good or we're okay or we're fine when like that's not the case because we've gotten used to the idea that people will ask how we're doing as a greeting instead of like actually caring. You know, you'll walk past someone at work or school or I don't know, pick wherever you are and someone will say, hey, how are you doing? And that at that point, that the question is a greeting. That's how it's being used. It's not a genuine question. And, and we get used to that idea. So we have these phrases, we have these idioms where we will tell people, I'm good, I'm fine. Like, it's kind of like when someone says like, how's your morning? And it's like, oh, it's a morning. Like, instead of, you know, people will be like, how's your mornings? Oh, it like, it's going. Like phrases like that are how we just brush off that greeting without actually answering the question. Because if we address the question, then it becomes this weird, awkward thing of like, do I tell them how shitty I am? Well, that's also not appropriate. So like, how do we balance this stuff? But then the problem becomes when we take that concept of not acknowledging how we're doing to other people and we apply it to all of the times when we're talking to other people. So then we never tell people how we're doing. So oftentimes we will say things like, I'm fine, I'm 
okay. I'm good. Even though we're, we're none of those things, realistically, because those words have just become a habit to spew out. That's why you have movies like The Italian Job and like Deadpool, where they're like, you know what fine means? Fucked up, insecure, neurotic and emotional, because it's poking fun at the fact that we say fine and we're none of we're not fine. But we've made it socially acceptable to like say that we're fine when we're not. So I see this character and we have this level of, of like sarcasm or this level of, of humor also making it easy to say that we're good when we're not. We can kind of see this too. Doctors are there to like care for this shit. Like <laughs> they're the they're the exact person that we should tell when we're not good. And this character has then seen it as their first option to say that they're good when they're not. That's kind of what I mean by that too. So let's be let's be a little more honest, which I recognize requires more vulnerability. And let's say that we're nauseous. <laughs> Again, who else would we tell if not a doctor? I'm just a, a little nauseous, is all. I just had a little bit of a moment. A big moment. But it's over now. <laughs> oh. uh, sorry, I ducked out. Uh, I'm already feeling much, much better. This is why they didn't see us through the stall. It's one of those, like, single-person bathrooms. That makes a lot more sense now. So we're doing better. I can hardly tell her the truth, can I? Most Why people not? don't actually want you to be honest with them. That's the exact same thing that I was saying, but like in less words, but less verbose, smaller sentence, same concept. <laughs> Let's talk about the oh, honesty. I apologize, Dr. Giagana. I just vomited up my breakfast. I had it all over my chin. It wasn't a good look. <laughs> it's hardly my fault. I haven't been handling stress very well lately. Look. I know I said that Ryan Gosling came in and he looked like a fucking zombie, but not like, not like vomit type zombie, like crying type zombie, not, not the vomit type. Like we gotta get our fucking zombies. We gotta get our movie genre straight here. <laughs> Fuck. It's hardly my fault or, so we can talk about the fault or like what's been going on lately. Mm, what's been going on lately? I guess it depends on what qualifies as lately. Hmm. <laughs> If we could take it to mean anything from yesterday to the day I was born, then I'm not lying. Let's just say that it's even more true now. Anyway, this isn't about me. I mean, the entire game is like about you, but whatever. Also, like this, this basically saying I've never coped with anything well in my life ever. But like, especially now, like this is the shittiest time for me to handle shit now. Someone gave me shit, told me to juggle it, and I found the worst way to drop it. And it wasn't even funny. Like, it, it wasn't even something that could entertain other people. So we can't now go back and talk about the other option, about it being their fault. The only other option that we have now is to be out in I'll a second. I'll be out in just a second. Those weren't here before. Do you, do you, you think they have any idea where they are? I'm sure this comes as a shock, but it is crucial that you understand the situation. Your mom had a brain aneurysm. Fuck. Do you know what that means? Mom. <laughs> Funny. I could never get myself to call her mom. She's always been married to me. Oh. As I understand it, it's a weakened artery wall? Correct. And that artery ruptured which caused a hemorrhage. It is a serious situation. We need to prepare for whatever happens next very quickly indeed. I've watched enough Grey's Anatomy to know that this is not good. I don't think Grey's Anatomy is like accurate medically. My, I'm not a doctor, thankfully. My understanding is that most medical shows probably like aren't great. Although I think Scrubs is supposed to be. I don't know, don't take my word for that. Not, still not a doctor. Microphone, you and I are gonna have to agree to stay out of each other's way. I don't do your job. Please don't do my job. I don't know how getting in my way is my job. Anyways, I think that it's interesting that the game is already touching on these concepts of trauma. I don't know whether the like skips in time are there for just like plot purposes, as in like, first of all, it's a demo. You can't show everything in a demo, otherwise it's not a demo. Get that. But also, are we talking about this idea of like disassociation? Because the game seemed to be potentially hinting about that when we're talking about like fainting and just like to show the hospital and then to skip ahead and be like, 
I fainted and I don't know like why I'm here type of thing. Like, I guess that made me wonder about the concept of like disassociation, this idea that like we're we're kind of like skipping out from the current moment. We're distancing ourselves the way to protect ourselves, which is something that can happen. Uh, it's usually associated with trauma. And the reason why trauma is something that I mention now is because this character is saying that they didn't call their mom mom. Like mom is always like uh, Marie, I believe was mom's name. Like mom is always like first name. And it is really unusual to hear that. Like culturally, we just always grew up with like mom is mom and dad is dad and all this other stuff. And usually when we don't see our parents in that way, like there's a reason for it. Usually it's the kind of thing where there is a great deal of shit that has fucking happened, whatever that looks like, to the point where we have created distance between our parents. And that's why we don't see our parents as like mom or dad or things like that. And it takes so much for that to happen. That's why I always pay attention. <laughs> that's why I pay attention when characters are like, uh, like when characters purposefully call their parents by their first name, because that is meaningful in that way. So that implies that there's some trauma with that. I'm not saying that mom directly caused the trauma. That's not necessarily the conclusion that I want to jump to, but that implies that there's some level of trauma that has happened that involves the parents in some way, shape or form. So the idea then that this character could dissociate as a, like a protective measure because of this trauma, like that's how they protected themselves through that trauma, potentially in their childhood, and now it still plays a role in their life now, makes sense to me. It also, I guess, is strange to me sometimes that like when people know medical things, I guess like, sure, Grey's Anatomy and shit like that has like changed how we see medical stuff. That's always a possibility, but a lot of times if we don't have personal experience with these things in some way, shape or form, we don't know what these things are. We don't know what they mean, even to the point of like knowing the actual definitions as in like I like I know the, the general overall concept of an aneurysm. Yes, but I didn't know the definition the same way that this character did. So that's another thing that I notice is like, wh why do you have that very specific medical expertise? Don't get me wrong, she mentioned Grey's Anatomy. Could it be that? Sure. Could it be something else? Sure. None of this is great. We or serious? You know, I'll admit, sometimes I talk for so long about things that have popped in my brain home that then I forget what they were talking about. Although it is really nice to like hear the fish tank sounds in the background the entire time I'm talking. Serious. Well, I mean, like, I think aneurysm usually implies seriousness, just like inherently with the concept. Let's talk about the we. We? I don't know anything about medicine. I work in administration. I, it's mostly paperwork. Oh. I'm not going to tell her that I'm a failed screenwriter. She would never take me seriously. Anything related to medical care will be my team's responsibility. But you are her trusted advocate. I I'm so sorry, you should be her aware. what now? Oh. Do you not remember? This is the reason we called you. We have your name and your number, which means that you signed the release. I have no idea what she's talking about. And Stop. since she's not able to express her will, it falls to you to speak on her behalf. But I presume you discussed that when you went through the process. <laughs> so you must know that there are a number of options to consider. The way the sound kind of like slowly becomes distant. I like that. A release of information is, um, at least in America, I don't know about France and other countries, but like, at least in America, a release of information is what gives like medical entities the ability to talk to someone. So in this case, the hospital could not legally talk to the daughter without the mom signing a release of information if she was like physically and mentally capable, of course. Um, and that's where legal forms like power of attorney and all that other bullshit comes into play. But like, that's that's the purpose in general of a release of information. It allows a medical entity to release information to someone who is not the patient. Otherwise, they can't do that. So, but if, if releases of information and paperwork was signed by our character and she doesn't remember that, like that to me is this aspect of how trauma impacts the parts of our brain that deal with like memory and emotion. And that's why oftentimes what we see with trauma is 
people either remember things like it is saved in their memory, like a, like a photograph it's like burned in there, or it's like they don't remember things. And that seems to be what we're seeing here is like she is not remembering things. So she's not remembering the fact that like she is now like the legal representative for her mom, like whatever name you want to call that. That's where it gets in like technicalities. So she has to be making these decisions for her mom, which then also gets in this weird territory of like if there's trauma associated with our like our mom, like how do we how do we then like make those decisions? Oh, that's like mm, that's that's like a weird thing there. And then, like, how do we feel about that? Oh, there's there's a lot to unpack there. Oh, there's a lot there. Plus, like, how do we see things about ourselves if we are realizing, like, that we're not remembering all of these things? Also, I noticed that she called herself a failed screenwriter. We never look at the word failure and say, yes, I want that. Which tells me that, like, it's not, it's not great. But if we're thinking that about ourselves, that comes with so much shame, blame, and guilt. That, like, that has all these pack... Th this... It's like a dump truck of fucking negative emotions that comes with that word. But like she doesn't hesitate to call herself this like failed screenwriter. She's instantly failed. So there's already like a shit ton of negative emotions that this character is like carrying along with her. I love how the choice is just like, fuck. I don't believe it. She put my name on the form without asking me. She may have she asked you. She forged my signature. But you don't remember. It's hardly a surprise. She's always done that kind of stuff. But I'm not making any important decisions i'm not like putting excuses out there for the mom because like i'm recognizing that there's like the potential of this trauma in the background and shit like that but like the doctor is saying that like potentially our characters signed the forms and like our characters like well i don't remember that therefore they must be forged and all this other stuff but like if we're having these memory things, maybe we were a part of that conversation. We just don't remember it, especially if the conversation is with someone associated with our trauma. If the conversation was with our mom, then there's like more of a potential that because there's that trauma association type thing, we, we could like have blocked it out kind of a thing. I'm not saying that this isn't a possibility with like, it's almost like I'm not defending the mom type of thing, but almost like this is also a possibility. So do we want to talk about the surprise or important decisions? Yeah, because like we don't want to. <sighs> That's really heavy to sit here and think I made this decision, especially if it went wrong. That feels like we're responsible for our life. Fucking nobody wants that shit. Let's talk about. I guess I wonder. Mm, let's talk about surprise, because I wonder if that'll go into like what the mom has done in the past. The phone call from the hospital. That was a surprise. I'd never have thought anything so serious would happen to her. Anyway, when she's back on her feet, she's going to have a good laugh about this. <laughs> the idea of me deciding on her behalf. I wonder, like, what she means about, like, nothing like this would have happened to her. It makes me think about this idea that, like, good things happen or, like, bad things happen to, like, good people type of a thing like only the what is the phrase like only the good die young type of a thing like i wonder if that's what she's kind of talking about the idea of me deciding on her behalf what does that mean does that mean like <laughs> i'm such a failure that like i couldn't make important decisions is that what you mean i've had my share of this kind of responsibility and it uh. didn't turn out well however my dear mother doesn't seem to understand. Ah. There's like... There's like a, a self-jab and like a jab at her mom at the same time. Like... The same... The same like mood is saying failed screenwriter, right? That type of self-jab. And at the same time... The type of jab where it's like... It's like that feeling where our parents don't listen to us and we're used to it because like low key it's been that way our entire lives and like we don't like it and we're tired of it and we're exhausted from it and really really wish that they would change but they're not and so we pretend it doesn't bother us but it really fucking does like that kind of a mood that's the feeling 
where it's like, I really wish that she would understand, but she does it. And that's like just how she is kind of a thing. Let's talk more about you. Like, what is your, like, how do you see yourself? I guess I, I have this urge to focus more on this character because I come from this perspective that like, we can, we can't like change other people. Don't get me wrong. Like we can try to like say things that may influence them, but there's a certain point where like, we can't actually, we can't actually make them change. Like we can't, but we can work on ourselves. So like what, what is our perspective on ourselves? So then we can work on changing that. that that's where I'm coming from. After all we've been through, what makes her think that I can make the right decision? Oh, Meeting us against one another at a time like this. That's exactly what my mother would do. I feel trapped like a fish in a barrel. I won't deny that feeling putting that out there, but I will always be a huge advocate that there is no such thing as like the right decision. I also actually really love how they put that in quotes already because I will talk to ages and ages. Think of it like a TED talk, right? Like I am a huge advocate that there is no such thing as like a right decision. That's doesn't that doesn't mean that we don't talk about it that way. Fair. What happens when we think that way is we are telling ourselves there's only two choices the right decision and the wrong decision. And then we put pressure on ourselves to where we have to make the right decision. And when we think that there are only two options, right or wrong decisions, we are ignoring the fact that the world is not that black and white. There are more choices than that. And so we we stop ourselves from seeing the gray area, from seeing the other choices that are possible. When we have that type of pressure, we then we might get into like doom scrolling or a ton of research because there's so much pressure to make the right choice, but we don't know what that is. And then when we make any type of decision, we are always making a decision based off of all of the information that we have on the t at the time. We don't usually try to like screw ourselves over, but then when we see the consequences of that choice, we then look at the consequences and we decide whether we like the consequences or not. If we like the consequences, we'll label that decision as the right decision. If we don't like the consequences, we will label that decision as the wrong decision. When we label a decision as the wrong decision, it's like we're basically saying that somehow we should have known better, like as though we could see into the future and say, ooh, this was the wrong decision and I'm gonna make it anyways, which doesn't make sense. We can't see into the future. And again, we always make decisions based off of all the information that we had have at the time, and so when we made the decision, that felt like the best choice. We didn't know any better. When we are also telling ourselves something is the wrong choice, we're assuming that, that the other choice, again, assuming that there's only one other choice, we assume that the other choice would be better. That the choice, if we had made the other choice, that the consequence of that choice would be better. And that's not always the case and we can't ever know that so it's all of these things that make me say there is no such thing as like a right choice or a wrong choice but yet that's how we talk about it and then we shame blame and guilt ourselves as though we should know all of these things but i love how they put quotes around this and they like the the writers really write a lot of this stuff really astutely, like really well, as far as like how we talk to ourselves. Because we can feel trapped and we can feel this way and feel like we're pressured to make the right choice and feel conflicted about our parents and all this other stuff. And like, this is how we will actually talk to ourselves. Cause like, what do you mean? Like you feel like a fish in a, like in a barrel? Like this also makes me wonder like, is there another sibling where it's like, this is gonna be a factor? Oh, come to think of it, I would love that. A 30 second memory and not a care in the world. Fear me, sharks, for I am the terror of the oceans. Hmm. Meanwhile, the that doctor's like, the nickname I got during the okay? class in middle school. What is that nickname? Sea hag. Oh! Haters, all of them. Lovely. I'm sorry, miss. <laughs> miss Fortin. Dumont. Like I said. I, uh, I went back to my maiden name. Oh. I'm sorry. That wasn't in your file. Listen, I understand that this is all very sudden, but we don't have a lot of time. We need to focus. We do indeed. I like how I made that joke about like, meanwhile, the doctor is like, you, you, you doing okay? <laughs> and then that, that actually happened. 
I don't know how many times I've played those games like Dragon Age or whatever, where like you have to make a choice and most of them aren't timed. So you can just sit there and, you know, you have a choice in front of you. And it's like, hang on, Dorian, I've got to go and like make a sandwich or whatever. And I really think it would be interesting if games like commented on that, like, you know, I've been sitting here waiting for you to make a choice for a very long ass fucking time. Because I've used those those moments as pause menus way longer than I like to admit. Why do you think I'm here or I'm sorry? Well, I imagine the doctor would say that you're here to be like what power of attorney or whatever it is. But the fact that this is an option makes me curious. Why do you think I'm here? Oh, let me be clear, miss. I'm not your enemy. I'm just the uncle physician. Oh, so we can work together to help your mother or we can wait seven hours, 22 minutes and 17 seconds. And then I can go home and you can pick up the conversation with Dr. Zorza instead. But I should warn you, Zorza is an old coot. No, you're right. I'm sorry. Okay. I guess I deserve that one. It's okay. I understand. It's not an easy situation. Our major concern right now is the hemorrhage is spreading. Shit. There's the risk of a cerebral vasospasm. That is a complication which could severely affect her brain. <laughs> is, is she going to die? Like an aneurysm wouldn't. Sure like, I shouldn't happen. laugh. But there could be long-term consequences. This sort of event severely impacts the body and mental functions may also be impaired. I need to know if you and your mother will be able to deal with that sort of complication. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> There's a lot of like very medical conversation that is happening here too. Like when someone is an on-call doctor, that means that like essentially they are not the long-term doctor for that person. So uh, I don't know what this would look like for an ER because essentially like Someone's not supposed to be in an ER for a long time. But it, let's say that someone was in the hospital already. The on-call doctor would be like, I don't know, whoever was there overnights. So if somebody had an emergency and the regular doctor like wasn't at the hospital to like be consulted about like, what do we do? Uh, because a lot of times when you're at the hospital, the doctor like has to be the one to make decisions. Like so they can't just give you medication. Technically, they have to like call the doctor and be like, Yo dog, I imagine nurses don't call doctors and say yo dog, but it'd be like yo dog, like can we give them aspirin? Can we give them whatever? Um, so the doctor has to be the one who technically like does a lot of shit in, in the hospital, if you get what I mean. So an on-call doctor is the one who makes those decisions when the doctor's gone, whether that be vacation, whether that be to sleep, like shit like that. So they're making a lot of these decisions even though it's not their patient technically a lot of the times, like that's my understanding of like what an on-call doctor does and like their purpose. So this idea of like, I am I, like, I understand where you're coming from and this is difficult, but if you and I don't have this conversation, you're going to have this conversation with someone else, someone else who may not be as empathetic, someone else who may not be the kind of doctor you want to deal with kind of an idea. And it sounds like this doctor is trying to, balance that line between empathy but also like let's be practical because this conversation of like it can like medical trauma exists medical trauma exists from stressed out fucking doctors or jaded doctors or, or anybody in the medical system or the medical system in general where we don't get the care that we feel like we should have had kind of a concept it's often like comes from very systemic causes even if it doesn't feel that way but it still is fucking traumatic Right. So medical trauma exists. I think that's worth validating and mentioning. But medical trauma can also be this idea, too, of this is a practical thing, but we have to make the decision now and you have to be the one to make that decision. So like the doctor is basically saying, like, these are things that are potential to like happen to your mother. It's almost like informed consent, this idea of like no know the possibilities we're not really consenting to that nobody would consent to that i think you get what i mean though like like this idea of like it's important to know that these are things that could happen and i guess i would interpret this question as because these are the things that could happen 
can your family handle that as far as like care goes? Or are we talking about setting your family up with English is failing me? case management like i'm sitting here thinking like from a case management perspective which would be like what a social worker would probably do in a hospital it would be this idea of like uh what services would you need then if your family couldn't do this i guess like that's how i'd be interpreting this this idea of like would you need nursing care in your home would she have to go to a facility that wasn't at your home and a lot of this would depend on what services were available in the community i don't imagine doctors would be the ones to have a lot of this conversation maybe they would i don't know because at this point, we'd be talking about services. Like, what services does your mom need? Because the doctor would have to be doing the doctor stuff regardless of what services are in the community, I guess. I don't fucking know. Maybe this is too much of an ideal world. Long-term impaired impacts the body. What's the biggest, most important thing? I mean, all these are important because if it impacts the body, that kind of causes the others. If, if someone's like impaired, that is a heavy word, then again, it's long term impacts the body. Let's, let's talk about the long term. No, it can't be. Oh. What about impaired? Holy. holy. Why can we talk more about the holy? Fucking. Oh. Shit. That's why. I'm not ready for this. I mean, who. Who would be? Shit, I don't understand. What do you mean? This is also a type of grief and loss. We're grieving the loss of the life that we thought we had. Like, who? how could we possibly be prepared for that? And even if we think that we're ready for that, we can't possibly be? Shit, I don't understand. What do you mean? These all sound like different ways of asking the same thing. Let's just... I don't understand. I don't understand... To be completely frank, if we're able to pull your mother through this, there's only a small chance she'll be like she was before. Small? How small? Smaller than that. In all probability, she will never be quite the same. Some people would prefer not to keep living under such circumstances. Oh. They'd rather their medical care were geared more around letting go as gracefully as possible. What I need to know is... <laughs> What would your mother want? I don't know how to answer that. Oh! Last time she told me she wanted something, it was... To be in MoMA? What's that? So are we talking about... Would we call that physician-assisted suicide? Wait, is that technically what it would be called? I guess the technicalities don't matter. It doesn't matter whether it's technically called physician assisted suicide at this point because we're still making the decision that is the same concept this idea of like do we make a decision that essentially means that our mother doesn't come out of this and it's a decision that we make and not just this idea of like we literally could not save her this idea of like we kind of didn't try as hard because it would mean that she wouldn't be the same person it's the same same concept, regardless of whether it's technically called, called this thing or the other thing. To like know that we are the ones who made that decision is heavy. You want to talk about trauma, right? Like that can be traumatic. It can be traumatic whether or not that's what they wanted. Because at a certain point, like we're sitting here going like, I'm the ones who still kind of like, like conveyed the message or facilitated it, however you want to talk about it. And in this case, we don't even know if that's what she would have wanted. So this idea of that, now I have to decide. Yay. What's MoMA? Be in MoMA. Excuse me? MoMA? The museum in New York. Miss de Mange. I... Wait. Your mother's that Marie de Mange? The artist? So, like... <laughs> The I think it's sidetracked because like, I don't know, mom's famous for something. It's like, it's like, what fucking actor were we talking about in the beginning? It's like hearing like, oh, Ryan Gosling. Is that who it was? I don't know. I got distracted by fucking drama and the sounds of the fish tank early on. It's almost like sitting there going, oh my gosh, your dad's that Ryan Gosling? Like, It was like completely fucking sidetracked. Like, 
everything we're talking about before, like that, it's it's gone. Oh, I hope that doesn't like play a part in it. I hope the doctor's not suddenly like, oh, well now we can't like do what we were talking about before because like now we have to do everything we can to like save her because that would be like a certain level of privilege, wouldn't it? Well, oh, also if we see our mom as like this successful artist, but then we see ourselves as like having failed, that's also like this certain level of comparison too about what does it mean to be successful? Oof. Big oof. Ah, there it is. Works every time. Oh, yeah. Once people figure out who Marie is, Marie. Yeah, their whole demeanor changes. Yay. They feel like they know her somehow. Wow. That sounds like some bitterness. Of course, they're completely wrong. Oh, she takes them in with her dog and pony show. But there's a world of difference between who she is in public and in private. And if this doctor knew Marie, the real her, she would realize how ridiculous her question is. Oh. We sh could s not should. Oh. We could say that the doctor's out of their mind. I mm, just I don't think that uh, eating insults at the person who's like helping your mom and you like even if we're bitter towards our mom putting that aside the doctor is like trying to hold some space and empathy for you as well like let's maybe like also try to not be rude back <laughs> yeah the doctor's having this response but like the doctor doesn't know so let's go with this other option. Yeah, the Marie de Mange. And I'm her assistant, I guess. I handle the business, the management, the press. We say that so because that we've be failed. Fully dedicated to her art, you see? Oh. Anyway, uh, the other day, I, I got a call from Centre Pompidou. They want to do a retrospective on her life and work. Hey. Can you imagine? The, the billboards, the crowds, the press, the whole shebang. And I'm like, hell yeah. I hop into my car, I rush over to tell her, I run into the workshop, yelling, and you know what she said? Uh, did you hear from Mama? Ugh. Like it's Someone not good told enough? Her they were considering her self-portrait eight, a canvas from her latest series. A whole exhibit in Paris, on the other hand, she didn't care. So, that's my mother. Most of the time, I don't know. I have no idea what she wants. I know what I'm asking isn't easy. I can give you a little time to think. Like that would change anything. It feels like there is so much bitterness towards our mom. Just like how we how we had a little bit of that like verbal diarrhea there, which sounds like a terrible way to say it, but it's, it sounds like we haven't had a lot of people that we can talk to about our mom, about our honest feelings on our mom. And even here, the doctor didn't snap at her. The doctor didn't, like, say it was a negative thing. The doctor seemed to take more of a practical approach. I, uh, yeah. I suppose I need to think about it. I'm sorry, I... I gotta go. That's very right. <sighs> We're just gonna like run away from it. I wanna put out there that like sometimes that's part of our like defense mechanism. It's like a habit that we have, kind of like shutting down. Where we may recognize it's not a great way to cope and deal with things, but it's just like, it's how we've always coped and dealt with things. So we don't know any other way to cope and deal with things. I know what she'd say, but I'm running away again. Like she knows. But again, like if we've if we've never learned how else to deal with things, then we sit here, we go, well, this is the only thing that I can do. And at a certain point, if what we've seen like demonstrated from parents or from the rest of the world is running away, then we sit here and we go, well, this is all I know. What did she expect? That I just show up and what? Decide whether uh, oh, she lives or she dies. Because huh. that's a really fucking heavy decision. Please don't make me drive. I don't even know how I'm supposed to make it to the end of the day, let alone 
Please don't make me drive. Oh my god. Oh god. That wasn't me, for the record. <laughs> Am I supposed to be looking at something in particular? Oh god. Don't. Don't have the pen hit me in the eye. I could like look to the left and look to the right, but then I started looking in the middle because I was terrified I was going to cause a car accident. I remember Diane and I found an injured bird in the backyard. It was tiny. I don't think it caused the car accident though. Just putting that out there. <sighs> I think it was around the time Marie had set up her new studio in the sunroom. Now that I think of it, that was also my first experience with death. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> In fact, I also had a really weird dream that night. Something about that day always seemed off. I never figured out why. And why am I thinking about this now? Biggest drama. And your first experience with death. I'm just saying. <laughs> Okay, so we can rewind and we can advance. So we can rewind. What are we looking for? Oh, paintings. Back then, Marie wasn't very well known, but she was hardworking. She had just started a series on birds, actually. They were all over the house. She considered them a symbol. Symbol of what? A postmodern symbol of anti anthropic levity. <laughs> Classic Marie. Okay. <sighs> God, it feels like I'm gonna be motion sick. <laughs> oh, yeah, the shadow. It looks like someone's breaking in, but also like it was the light on the jacket, but it also looks like a bird. I think I saw a big shadow moving down the hallway that night. I imagined a monster bird was visiting us. For a long time, I thought it was just a strange dream. Microphone. Stop. It's getting dramatic. Also, you have a sister? But you haven't mentioned your sister. Why are you the only one making the decisions for your mom? Oh. Do you recognize it? This is the mobile that Marie made me before I was born. Wait. It's exquisite and delicate. I loved it. And you did too. No, no, no. I still have it in a box somewhere. Pause. Pause. No, pause. Stop. Break. What whatever. We're no. You can keep doing what you're doing. Game. We have not up until now, narratively, this game is actually just going to keep doing what it's doing. Narratively, I was gonna get very white in a second. It's distracting me. Narratively, the game has been talking about like uh the narration as though it is just this character talking to themselves, where it's like, I'm just lying on the bathroom floor. Because, right, like when we talk about like inner monologue, not everybody has an inner monologue. Putting that out there. I don't know the statistics the statistics and like who does and who doesn't but like that's how the game is kind of like presenting this narration is like this is our inner monologue this is us talking to ourselves right like that's how the game is putting this out there the game has not used the word you and now it did it it the, the game is like talking to us like we were there like we were the sister that was very different because it was like, you used to always like this mobile. Don't you remember the mobile? I think I still have it somewhere. It's like, that was a very different shift in narration. That's weird. I don't need a zoom up of that bird. Thank you very much. How about the suitcase? <laughs> suitcase. Ha, yeah, Diane was so proud of packing her own suitcase. Like, this is all third person. Her father came to pick her up that afternoon. Oh. She spent the weekend with him and her stepsister. So, how, what? I was a bit jealous. But also happy to have some time with my mother. So is Diane 
uh, Diane, I guess. Diane, a stepsister to us or a friend? What is our relation to them? Now I know for certain that someone was in the backyard that night. And since Diane was at her father's, it must have been Marie. What was she doing out there? Maybe... Because, like, everything has been third person, even. Like, when we talk about our mom, we talk about Diane, it's all third person. It's like, you know, we use their pronouns third person, their name third person, except for that one moment with the mobile. Interesting. I'm intrigued. I mean, you know, that's not my name, but I'm intrigued. Very intrigued. Oh, uh, uh, that shift. Birds. Marie was always quite passionate about birds. So I suggested we keep this one as a pet once it got better. I could already imagine it. A beautiful cage tucked in the corner of the studio. Oh, honey. She got so mad. Oh. At the time, I didn't understand why she reacted like that. But now... I mean, an injured bird like that probably isn't going to get better. Marie told us she'd take care of the bird, so we went back to playing. I never saw it again. And when I asked what happened, she said it just flew away. Really? I'm so relieved. I mean, like, if it was an older bird, you know, like pheasants, where they're like, I'm going to pretend to be hurt, so you'll leave my nest alone. Like, that would make sense. But, like, a smaller bird like that? Oops. So, like, we know that the mom is obsessed with birds because of their symbolism. Kids then bring her an injured bird and are like, let's keep it. But, like, it's like the difference between adults' perspective and kids' perspective to where the kids have, like, kids don't know any better. Kids have, like, this hope that it'll get better, but, like, well, it's... Gosh, these, like, ships. So, like, this is, this is us in bed, right? You see, but like, I guess this is why I'm confused about their relationship, because like, we have our name and their name on the bedroom door. Like, like we're siblings. Maybe we're like playing house or something, and we put the name on the door. Is there something else that we can see? Where we see the moon? Gosh. The nest was high up in the tree, but the wind blew it down. Is the, the game like helping me? Young. It, it was a big fall. It must have been badly hurt. I didn't realize it at the time. <laughs> Is the game sitting here like, oh honey, you're not finding this clue. Let's like let's like nudge you along a little bit. Well, I mean, the bird doesn't look like it's doing that great. Don't get me wrong. This is like, it's like one of the only things that's moving and the camera very visibly like goes towards it a lot. Like that motion is not great. Like, it just doesn't look great. Oh, uh, you know, the game doesn't start with content warnings, but like maybe consider this a verbal content warning about maybe like some animal harm and death. I'm putting that out there. Maybe Marie killed the bird. That's what she was doing out there in the middle of the night, burying it in secret. And it might sound strange, but I also understand why she did it. I mean, this idea of, like, put it out of its misery and, like, don't let it suffer and, like, don't let the kids see it suffering. Also, like, she buried it. There's that. Also, like, she didn't tell the kids or let them see it. It's kind of like how it's socially acceptable to tell kids, like, ooh, we sent... Like, we sent the animals to the farm. 
Instead of like that they died. All or nothing. I think it's an interesting theme that this is a memory about death and like putting something out of its misery. Right after that the conversation about mom. Marie is really an astonishing person, you know. She's usually hard, but also she could be vulnerable sometimes. She couldn't stand seeing the bird injured. She knew it would never recover. It was too weak. I remember she said, not being able to fly, that's no life for a bird. She thought it would be better off dead. She could have just abandoned it, let things run their course. But I don't think she did. What's the sound? She killed it with her own hands. It sounds cruel, doesn't it? <laughs> but that's just Marie. That's her outlook on life. She's all or nothing. All or nothing also isn't like a healthy perspective on life. Oh! We were still crashing. I... I think... My legs are shaking. Maybe I'm having another turn. I think I need a sugary drink. Don't we all? Do you need anything? <laughs> Well, I need more coffee. I... But if I drink another one, my stomach's going to declare war. <laughs> I do not know a doctor who wouldn't have coffee or an energy drink. It's probably an energy drink, quite honestly. Like, that, if they were to, like, dissect doctors without killing them kind of a thing, right? Like, it's probably caffeine running through their veins. Not healthy. You want to talk about systemic issues, right? Anyways. Um, I wonder what that sound was, though. Like, it, it just like, kept going. And I wonder if that will come back. So much of this game is about, like, piecing together these little clues. But, like, all or nothing perspectives and mindsets are not healthy putting that out there all or nothing mindsets are either like one thing or the other like entirely and the world is not built that way so black or white thinking that's all or nothing and the way that i kind of like to describe what i mean when i say that this isn't healthy is this idea that the world is not black or white and the problem with black or white thinking is we try to categorize everything in the world into one or two categories but how do we do that so if we are using black and white as an analogy how do we put red into black or white how about blue? Like, it, that's where it becomes difficult. And the reason why we start doing all or, nothing, all or nothing thinking or black and white thinking is because it simplifies the world around us. It's really easy to ask someone, do you want pizza or burgers? Like, that's easy. It's easy and it simplifies things. But it doesn't work for everything. So that's where it becomes a problem is we take this, this mindset, this perspective, and we apply it to everything. Because we actually saw this with our own character when our own character was saying, I have to do the right thing. Saying something is right or wrong is black or white thinking, is all or nothing thinking. It's the same thing, just like different words. I'm not ducking out, not this time. Okay. After all, isn't this what Marie wanted? I, I just can't speak on my mom's behalf. Won't we have to though? Or Won't we'll have to make a choice. Sure. She's a radical. She's Rad all or nothing. All the time. I understand. It's hard to contemplate the idea of living with a disability. It's not that, not at all. If we were talking about me or, or, or someone else, I would say it's gonna be fine. You adapt, people do it all the time. They have to. Life's too important. I would say that. She wouldn't. I'm not sure that answers your question. She certainly comes across as rather f forthright. <laughs> you don't say. I've seen her on TV a couple of times. My father loves her. She's an extraordinary artist. In her interviews, she's so impressive, fierce even. It must be quite something to be the, the, the daughter of someone so talented. I've heard this uh, before. Hi, bar to live up to. That's a way to say, it can't be easy to have a nutcase for a mother. I also don't know how often people sit here and think like 
can I get you anything when it comes to their doctors? There's like this society's expectation of like, because you're here to help me. It, like, that's not something that I think often comes up. But that idea that we're talking about is like, how do we live up to our mother's legacy? If we feel like we're constantly being compared to our mother, we're inherently never going to live up to that expectation. But if we feel that we have to, we're set up to fail just instantly all the time. And we've kind of seen that, right? Do we get used to that or it's quite an experience? I don't think we've fucking gotten used to it. Because we, we've already used the word failed. Or it's quite an experience. This sounds like a nice PC way of saying it. Let's go with that. Yes, it's quite an experience. <laughs> Microphone. Doctor, I... Do we know why? Why this happened? We were just having dinner last night. She was... She was fine. She, she, there could be a lot of factors. Family history, hypertension, alcohol consumption. I did have a pretty severe hangover this <laughs> I was just thinking, would we Even interpret that trauma, as, what do we like do? A historic head injury. It's hard to say ah. right now. TBI. All right, Miss Demange, I'll give you time to think. Let's speak again in about two hours, if that works for you. Uh, sounds good. Um, can I see her? Yes, of course. Let theme me find of, out her of death. Let's zoom in on the dead fish. Damn. I wonder now if mom has had a TBI. The traumatic brain injury, I guess. I've, like a head injury that's like worse than a concussion, I guess. It, like severely impacts our brain. And this idea of like, does this character even use alcohol to cope? This idea, like, the things that are listed off, I'm sure ha could have an impact on an aneurysm, but this idea, like, how do we then interpret that about ourselves? Like, are we following our mother's footsteps in that way? I know what I have to do, what I should do. But... It wasn't that long ago that I could write this kind of scene without breaking a sweat. <laughs> I step into the room, there'll be tubes everywhere, beeping sounds. The audience will know that it's serious. Aneurysm then implies I start that. I bawling my eyes out. I collapse <laughs> on my mom's bed, Pouring out snot from my nose. Or we're cold and distant, right? Or maybe I'll be dignified, stony faced, standing quietly in the corner. It doesn't Close have to mean dignified. Face. They'll see I'm suffering deep inside. A single tear rolls down my cheek. All of those like emotional reactions implies that we have the time and like the mental resources essentially to like process the emotions right now. And that's not always the case. Essentially, like there is no wrong way to react to a situation like this. That's exactly how it will happen. Or what should happen. There's just one problem. Are we still in the car accident? Ah, <laughs> I was like, no, don't sue me back. <laughs> I have to go in, yeah. The, like, anticipation anxiety that, like, builds. I really must. She probably needs me. She's awake. At this point, it's more about what do you need. I don't know why, but I can't open that door. Because this is more about what you need right now than what your mom needs. If she's not even awake, it's more about you. Oh! <laughs> I was like, who is this? <laughs> it's a very dramatic place to end it. I really like this so far. I feel like the writing, I know I said this before, but I feel like the writing really conveys like how we talk to ourselves about things. I love how you can dig in about certain things and find out more and there's just enough of like this hint of mystery about like, well, what happened at certain points? Like, what is the relationship between this main character and Diane? And more about like the history between the mom and the main character. I also like how there's, um, how do I put this? Like realistic accents? <laughs> like, 
you can tell that they're French. And like, that's okay. Like, if we're embracing that human people are humans, as you do, then it's okay that they have accents. I guess I point that out because, like, you almost get used to... I don't know if you'd say American accents or, like, just... To me, I know it would sound like a lack of accents, but I know that that's not the same for everybody. But So I guess American accents in games, but it's not a bad thing to have voice actors play roles where they have accents, is essentially where I'm coming from. I'm looking forward to playing the full version of this game, just because of how it is about loss and trauma and the way that we talk to ourselves and just kind of like the way the game plays out, <laughs> like how I really thought that we were going to be back in the car accident at the door. And I'm very curious about how there is a second person perspective at the mobile. This is like this mystery about it that I'm very intrigued about. So I would love to hear your thoughts on this demo and the video, and then I will see you next time.